This is Real Estate Rookie episode 223. I relate everything back to my world of, of kayaking and, and being an athlete. And through my decades of, of competing, I've, I've just realized that you either, you kind of win or you learn. Um, and through loss, I try to use that as like a learning experience. So I knew that I'm either gonna figure this out and it's gonna be a great and a home run hit because I was running the numbers and I was like, this is either gonna be like too good to be true or I'm gonna learn from this experience uh, and I'm gonna keep, you know, taking those baby steps forward. And so kind of using that win or learn mentality instead of the win or lose. And it kind of got me into, you know, that first deal, which then got me into the second and the third and the fourth and has kept me moving forward. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I'm here with my co-host, Tony Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, information, motivation, and education you need to kickstart your investing journey. And oftentimes, we like to start the, the podcast with some reviews from some wonderful people in the Real Estate Rookie community. And uh, this week's review comes from... Uh, it's actually a, a crazy username. I can't even say it. It's like SP with like 30 different numbers behind it. But this person says, I've been a listener of the BP podcast for years, but I find myself prioritizing this one throughout the week. I love getting insight into small scale investors and I find it super relatable. And I think the balance between Ashley's and Tony's strategy is an awesome learning experience. I'm so inspired by the stories. And even though I have a decent amount of knowledge, I still consider myself a newbie and I enjoy hearing from other people's journeys. So we appreciate that. If you guys haven't left an honest rating review on whatever platform you're listening to, take the five minutes, do it. We really appreciate it. The more folks that we uh, can reach from the podcast, more folks we can help. And that is ultimately our goal here. So Ashley Care, we just got back from uh, hanging out in person, which we don't get to do all that often. I know. Uh, so if you guys listened to episode 217 with Evan and Katie Miller, uh, we actually went uh, out to Denver and got to interview them live, which was so much fun. Um, and actually, so my business partner, Daryl, came with me and he uh, on the way home, I like fell asleep on the plane, like took up two seats and everything. And it was like crawled up in the fetal position and he took a picture of me and he's like, oh, Ashley, after her bigger pockets bender. <laughs> but it was so much fun. Just like three days, all real estate people. We had a meetup. Over 300 people came to the meetup. So make sure you guys are checking out um, our Instagram accounts and the Bigger Pockets Instagram account to find out where we're going next for our next meetup. Yeah, it's always so cool to get to meet people from the, the rookie community. And there were literally people that flew in just for the meetup, which was like, so unreal to me. So, I mean, it was, it, it's always so cool to get to meet folks and, and we had a wonderful, wonderful time. Um, and yeah, like Ashley said, looking forward to being able to do it again soon. Um, what else is new, Ash? What else you got going on? Um, I'm actually sitting in uh, a new Airbnb that's about to go live. So it's my second Airbnb arbitrage. I rented another unit within the same apartment complex and it, the bed just got delivered a couple of days ago and I just need to get a couple of chairs and a few odds and ends and the thing is ready to go. I actually had my mom set it all up for me and so today was my first time seeing it with everything put away and in its place and it looks great and I'm super excited. It's just a, a one bedroom unit and then the other unit we have in the building already is a, a two bedroom so it'll be nice to kind of have a, a good dynamic here and plus, you know, if you have a you know, people coming for a wedding or things like that. It's nice that two families can rent out the units and be close together too. Yeah. I love that. I, I'm, I'm excited for my, my invite out to Buffalo so I can, uh, I can critique your units in person and, and give you, give you some <laughs> yeah, feedback. I, I would love that. I would love that so much. Can you create like a handbook and stuff like that too while you're here? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Or> the- <laughs> you know, it's actually been like a pretty crazy week for us at our properties. Like we have, um, one of our cabins is like in, like in the mountains, mountain, mountains of Tennessee. Um, and we've been dealing with this mice issue. It's like, uh, like we've we've had multiple exterminators come out but like they can't seem to like find and catch these mice and the only time these mice show up is when there's a guest at the property so we've been like refunding guests at this property we had another property like two of our tiny houses in joshua tree uh the mini splits like the drains got cl- clogged because there was like flooding out there or something i don't even really know what the reason was but like the minutes the mini split started like dripping onto the wall and like overnight ruined two of our mattresses at two different properties because there was just this drip so anyway 
I'm saying all this stuff to to give you a heads up. Now that you've got two, the chances of you having weeks like mine are are, are starting to increase. You got issues going on all these properties at the same time. So, yeah, Daryl actually moved to one of our cabins, um, and so he moved into it. And I'm pretty sure it was the first night he was there. There was a mouse running across a beam. His son saw, it and it's scooting across. And so he's like, I don't know what to, I don't know what to do with this thing. He's like, I know I don't want to sleep here if there's a mouse running around. So he actually got his son's BB gun and he shot it off of one of the rafters it was running on. I was no like way. amazed. I'm like, I didn't know you're such a great shot. My God. And, hey, and I'm tell Daryl I got a free night anyone. and a flight ticket to send him out to Tennessee. If he can <laughs> yeah. get this mice problem handled for us, I'm I'm all for it. And I apologize to anyone who is sensitive about the mice being hurt. I apologize for that. I understand that it is not nice to do, but uh he is a man that does not care, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> this property, this is the same property where we've had a beaver problem. With, with the beavers? We damming up the ponds. <laughs> yeah, like there's just nature yeah. everywhere on this. You like pull in the driveway and there you are at a very high risk of hitting a deer running across the driveway as you pull yeah, in. No so, way. But uh, yeah, it's it's such a cool. So you have to come out to that property too when you visit. Uh, we call it the compound. Yeah. So it's got a couple cabins on it. There but. you go. Cool. Well, should we talk about today's guest? We got a good one for today, right? Um, so we, we've got Nick Troutman today. And Nick is a professional athlete, but not in the traditional sense that most people think when they hear athlete. He doesn't. He's not an NFL player or an NBA player or baseball or hockey. Um, Nick is actually a professional kayaker. Um, which is like so cool. You don't really hear about that all that often. Um, and he, he kind of talks about his story about realizing that being a professional kayaker, which is very different from being a different type of professional athlete, doesn't come with the same type of security that, that you would think. So he talks about how that realization kind of motivated him to get started in real estate investing. Yeah, my dad would always have us do rolls in our ponds and kayaks when we were younger to like do those and flip them. And my brothers actually got pretty good. But I'm pretty sure the level of kayaking <laughs> that uh, Nick does is uh, way different than way uh, different. me and my pond as a child. In your pond. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's got like 80 foot waterfalls he's coming off of. And crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, my biggest takeaways on this is just like the power of being by like-minded people of, you know, being constantly told like, you're crazy, you shouldn't do this. And, you know, that applied to him in both his profession and real estate investing too, is surrounding your people, surrounding yourself with people who are like-minded, who are like, yeah, you're, what you're doing isn't normal. You're weird just like us, but that's way better because you can do so many different things and you have greater opportunity. Um, so that was my, my biggest takeaway. And then just him talking about, you know, risk and fear and, you know, versus danger, actually, and what the differences between those were the big takeaways. So make sure you guys listen all the way through. Um, he also mentions towards the end, and I won't give it away, but what his favorite podcast is. So you'll want to check that out too. <laughs> Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Why don't you start off with telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in real estate? Well, thanks, Ashley. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, well, I am a professional athlete, uh, whitewater kayaker, uh, father of two, husband, and um, yeah, I travel around the world doing what I love, uh, which is kayaking and exploring and adventuring. I've got a, I guess, a family adventure TV show, which is pretty fun. Um, but a couple years ago, I guess after my second uh, child, when my daughter was born, I had this, I don't know if this was like a fatherly instinct or this provider syndrome or what, but I just had this like deep need and desire to figure out how to provide for my family. And so I started like researching uh, finance and, and money and all this stuff and realized that there is this global game being played of financial freedom and finance and money. And I didn't even know the rules of the game and yet alone like how I was doing or that I was even really playing this game. And so started reading a ton of books, started learning a ton. Um, and eventually 
uh, stumbled upon real estate and a friend actually introduced me to the Bigger Pockets podcast. He was like, you should just just go check out Bigger Pockets. Um, I was about to like invest in one of those like $30,000 programs where some guru was going to teach me how to do real estate. And my wife wasn't too into that idea. So uh, I started researching bigger pockets, realized that there was just a ton of value and and free information. Um, and being just like, I don't know if it's my personality trait or being a professional athlete or what, but I just like, I dive head in and and I'm like super obsessed. Um, and so I think I listened to like every podcast available, read a ton of the books and, uh, and yeah, just like got super obsessed with real estate, which is, which is pretty awesome. You went um, down the rabbit hole, right? I, yeah, I went fully went hole. down the rabbit hole. Exactly. Um, and then yeah, during COVID I, um, pulled the trigger on my first, uh, rental property, which was pretty cool and haven't looked back since. Yeah, Nick, there's a couple, we're only like, what, 60 seconds, two minutes into this conversation, you already said some some pretty insightful things. Uh, one of the things you said was you, you, you realized that there was this game being played. And, and you didn't even know that the game existed, let alone what those rules were. And, and I, you know, it, it's, it's such a, I, I just like the way that you phrased that. Because I, I just shared on my Instagram story yesterday, um, Sarah and I, my wife, we posted a video on on YouTube about like our you know our journey in real estate investing, and uh, there was someone who commented and said that we were terrible people because um, we're taking homes away from uh, from people that could 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 otherwise buy them. Um, just saying like you know a bunch of mean stuff to us on on the internet, and it was so funny because there was that one comment that was super negative. But then there were like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, there's like a hundred plus comments and the, the majority of them were positive. And everyone's saying like, man, I, I wish I could aspire to be like you guys. And, you know, I, I shared this on my story. I was like, you know, for me growing up, we rented my entire life. Like we, we always rented homes. We never owned. It wasn't until I became an adult and I had my own money that I was able to, to afford to buy something. But as a kid growing up, I was never like upset at the landlord for being the landlord. I was always thinking like, man, how can I become a landlord myself and play that game at the same level? So it, it, I just thought that was such a such an interesting way to kind of phrase it because it's like the game is being played regardless. So you can either be mad that the game exists or you can you can start taking the steps to learn how to play the game yourself. Yeah, and and again, through being like an athlete, like it's just that that game mentality that I regularly think of, Tony, where the game's being played regardless, and and so if. Uh, if I'm a you know professional kayaker and I'm going to go do a freestyle competition, the judges are scoring me. the The time is is going, and I either can know the rules of the game and learn how to play by those rules, and then do the best that I can due to the rules of the game, or I can just like go out there and hope that you know whatever I do gets scored high or or whatever it is. But like it's like that in everything in life. There's there's I guess I just like to gamify everything, but you can think of it that everything is a game. And once you start to learn that there are rules to each game, just like there are rules to school, school is set up. I mean, unfortunately, not that I'm trying to go down that ta tangent, but um, where it's like it's set up for people to be tested on one, the subject that they're learning and, and two, the information that they've been given. And then three, it's really about like how to remember that information. You could go study for an exam and just like you just brainwash yourself. Think of like study it all. You you do the test and then the next day you forget it all. And great, you got 100 percent or whatever, a high uh, grade on your test. It doesn't mean that you actually remembered it. And so um, that's just like gamifying school and and, and whatever. But everything has like a, a gamification, I guess. And and once you learn how to play by those rules, uh that's where the success comes in, I guess. I, I don't know. That's a, that's a great point, Nick. And you mentioned something else I want to circle back on, but just really quick on the on the gamify piece. It, it makes me think of like, I'm not a boxer by any means. So you guys forgive me if I get this metaphor like totally off. But like you think about watching Floyd Mayweather box, a lot of his fights were boring because all Floyd Mayweather was doing was like dodging good defense. And then he, he get a couple body blows. But, you know, a lot of his fights didn't end in knockouts, but he continued to win because he understood the game that if he protected himself well, he landed a few good punches when it came time to make a decision, he was going to win. So, Nick, it, it's a it's a great metaphor for life that once you understand the game that's being played and you understand the rules, you can then figure out the way to be successful in that game. 
Um, something else you mentioned, Nick, which resonated with me pretty deeply. You said you had a deep need and desire to provide for your family after your second kid came. And I think it's it's an interesting statement for you to make because, I mean, you, you were a professional athlete. You, you kind of traveled around the world. You were making a living for yourself. What, like, why did you feel that that living you were making wasn't enough to be able to provide for your family? Like, why did you feel the need to, to, to do more? Oh, gosh, that's a, a good question and deep question there, Tony. Um, uh, I guess, first off, I, I would clarify that um, – I am a professional whitewater kayaker. That is a very different income level than like a professional uh, NBA, NFL, soccer, any of the like traditional sports. Like those guys are making pretty good income. Um, I'm stoked with the income level that I make and and so forth, but it's a very different living. Um, and And I'm only really able to make a living at it by doing a lot of different things. Uh, so within kayaking, you know, I make a little bit of money from, um, from sponsorship deals or from, uh, social media stuff. Nowadays, I make a little bit of income, maybe from possibly winning events and and some prize money. I make a little bit of income from, uh, from teaching or coaching. I make a little bit of income from maybe selling, um, content like videos or photos to magazines or to TV or whatever. Uh, with our new TV show, I make a little bit of, of income there. And so piecing all of that together, it's enough to, to make, you know, a living, uh, and doing, doing it that way. Another, kind of aspect of your, of your question, um, is like, why wasn't that enough? Well, I also, I wake up every day and I'm super grateful that I live my dream life every day. I'm like, man, I'm fully living my dream life. I'm doing exactly what I want to do. I get to, uh, to travel the world with my family. I have, uh, freedom. I get to be, uh, be with my, with my family every day. Um, and I don't want anybody to ever take that away from me. Um, so, you know, right now, if, uh, if we were to lose a sponsorship deal or if we were to lose, uh, our, our TV deal or, or, or whatever it is, like there's, there's several legs that kind of keep the chair, of, uh, standing, but if you start losing a couple of them, you know, the chair might fall. And so I'm trying to think, how can I figure out a way to create this financial freedom without any of that? And so my goal in life is, um, to have enough real estate that it could substitute all of everything that I do so that I could continue this dream life and continue traveling and spending time with my family and, and paddling and exploring and all that stuff. Uh, even if, you know, the brand partnerships fell through or, or, uh, or, you know, God forbid I got injured or something like that and I couldn't even paddle anymore. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the game plan and the goal. And yeah, I don't know. There was, again, you, I'm not sure if you had it or not, Tony, but the idea of just like becoming a parent, like just there was this deep like provider syndrome and I just like, I've never had it or didn't have it nearly as much with my, with my firstborn. Um, but for some reason the second came in and I was like, I've got to provide for my family. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Was it like the firstborn, you know, strong willed can survive on their own, but the second one got to take care of this <laughs> one. <laughs> You know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if <laughs> if it was just that I was like younger for the first, yeah. um, or if it was the fact that like my second born, uh, like our first was I had a son, and then our second was was our daughter, and so I don't know if it had something to do with like, you know, the father daughter. I really I have no idea other than I have this like I yeah just this this deep provider syndrome. I don't know. Well, Nick, before we go too far, uh, what does your portfolio look like today? What does my portfolio look like today? We have uh, we have four properties as of right now, uh, or four rental properties as of right now, and we have seventeen units. Um, so a couple, I guess we've got a, a couple duplexes, triplex, single family, and then uh, our last one was a nine unit uh, apartment building. That's awesome. And when did you first start? How long did it take you to acquire those seventeen units? Um, we started kind of like mid 2020. So it's, uh, it's coming up on like two years now. I think at one point when we first hit the 17 units, I think we, we, uh, we actually, I think I got 17 units in 16 months, uh, or, or somewhere right around the 17 month mark. And then we've slowed down a little bit after this last nine unit being that, uh, each one we've kind of done the, the Burr method and, 
This last one has been a pretty extensive rehab, uh, and we're still in the midst of, of the rehab of the nine unit. And so um, I, I have learned lessons along the way. And in part of that, uh, I realized that I should slow down on the accumulation of units and properties and still kind of make sure that I've got that cash uh, ready for the unknowns, because uh, what I've learned along the way is that there's always unknowns in any rehab project. Um, so yeah, we've got some more some more properties, and we're still in acquisition mode and still trying to buy some more and whatever. But um, but I've I've kind of slowed down until slowed on the gas a little bit until this nine unit is finished. Anyway, Nick, what made you decide to go with the burr strategy? There's so many different ways you could have invested in real estate. And why did you end up choosing that? And if you can define bird, Nick, for those that aren't familiar with that phrase. Yeah. So I guess to, to define the burr strategy, it's buy, rehab, uh, rent, refinance, repeat. I had to double check that I had all my R's in the right order there. Um, and the way that, or I guess why we went with it was um, in my learning phase of, and I'm still in the learning phase, but definitely in the early learning phase of listening to a lot of uh, bigger pockets and reading a lot of the books. To me, that one just seemed like one of the most powerful methods for getting into real estate in the sense that you can actually recycle that same um, seed capital. So the, the proper, the, the money that goes into the property, you can refinance, pull that back out, and then use that same money for the next property. Um, and that's exactly what we've been able to do. And uh, it's worked really well. And that alone is the reason why we've been able to accumulate the properties as quick as we have. And, and I would definitely um, say the, you know, so-called success that I've had um, this far has to do with the Burr property or the Burr methods uh, with our properties. And the other thing too was like within learning all of this, um, I read um, David Green's book, Long Distance Real Estate Investing. Uh, and for me, that was such a huge light bulb and, and shift because a lot of the interviews on bigger pockets, you'd hear about people trying to get out of their nine to five, trying to um, find that financial freedom so that they could leave their job. And, and for me, I'm like, I love my job. I, I don't want to leave at all. And because my job, you know, involves me traveling a lot, I had to figure out how could I do this, you know, on the road? How could I do this kind of away from like uh, the properties and, and not being able to be hands-on managing and all that kind of stuff? And, and David Green's book really spelled it out so clearly for me that I finished the book and I was like, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. And so we, we bought that first property. I had never seen the property. I had never met our property manager. I had never met any of the contractors. I literally did it all over the phone. And then I was like, oh my gosh, it totally works. Uh, and I was, it was kind of like a test to see if, you know, if the whole theory behind it, it's easy to have a theory, but to, to implement it sometimes is a little bit different. Um, and in everything in life, I mean, again, kind of like I relate everything back to my world of, of kayaking and, and being an athlete. And through my decades of, of competing, I've, I've just realized that you either, you kind of win or you learn. Um, and through loss, I try not to use the word loss uh, or losing. And I try to use that as like a learning experience. So I knew that I'm either going to figure this out and it's going to be a great and a home run hit because I was running the numbers and I was like, this is either going to be like too good to be true or I'm going to learn from this experience uh, and I'm going to keep, you know, taking those baby steps forward. It's so kind of using that that win, um, win or learn mentality instead of the win or lose. And it kind of got me into, you know, that first deal, which then got me into the second and the third and the fourth and has kept me moving forward. Nick, I've, I've talked a lot on this podcast about me losing thirty thousand dollars on the Shreveport home, but I guess I need to I need to change that and say I had a thirty thousand dollar lesson yeah. on that Shreveport home moving forward. Um, 
So yeah, it's a, it's a good way to good way to frame things, um, Nick. So you you're, you're you're like all over the 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 country, literally, and you're even outside of the country right now as we're recording this podcast episode. Where is where is home base for you? Like like if you say this is where I live, is is there a part of the country that you call home? Yeah, so we do have a house and a home base, uh, Rock Island, Tennessee, small town just outside of a, a state park in uh, in Middle Tennessee, which is just a gorgeous place. Um, but again, through my work and, and being an athlete, we're on the road anywhere from six to 10 months out of the year traveling around with, with a truck and a trailer. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, so we're definitely on the road quite a bit, but but Tennessee yeah. is is still... I guess where we call home, where where we go home for the holidays, anyway. Yeah, and then so and your your home is is Tennessee, give or take. Where of these seventeen units, like where are these spread out at? What what, what markets are you investing in? Yeah, so the the first the first eight were in um, were in Columbus, Georgia, and being that my you know being that I've been able to super fortunate to be able to travel around the country, uh, I get to see a lot of different markets. And so what brought me to Columbus, Georgia was a whitewater park. Um, and it's actually going to be the home of the world championships next year. So that'll be super cool. But I used to go down to, or I had been going down to this, uh, to this city to go kayaking a fair amount. And I had noticed that they were really putting a lot of money into, um, um, kind of just redoing a lot of the, the riverfront community and, and a lot of money was going into kind of uh, upkeep in in that city and, and just trying to reintroduce a lot of the the older buildings and stuff like that. Um, and then when I was running numbers, it just had a great rent to price ratio. Um, the, the rents for the, the purchase price really were some of the most favorable in like every market in the United States that I had looked at. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, let's start here. Uh, the next market and, and the one that we bought our nine unit in is in Cookville, Tennessee, which is about 40 to 60 minutes outside of Nashville. Uh, and it's about 35 to 40 minutes from where I actually live. And so pretty familiar with the, um, with that city, uh, Tennessee tech is there. So there's, uh, it's kind of like college, college town, um, outside of Nashville. Definitely it's, it's been growing quite a bit in the, in the last coming years. And, and being that that's where, you know, being the closest city, that's where we go for like date night and stuff like that, uh, that I kind of knew that area quite well over the last couple of years and, and I could see it growing. Um, and I just felt, you know, comfortable. And again, it was just another one of those deals that uh, came across that I was like, man, this seems too good to be true. Um, and so we ran the numbers. It looked really good, put in an offer and uh, yeah, bought a property. And, and like every property that we've bought, um, there's always the unforeseen and there's always the troubles afterwards. But uh, but yeah, it keeps me moving forward with those kind of baby steps one at a time. I think one thing we want to highlight right here is that you started investing in a city that you knew, that you had visited, that you had liked. And I think it can get so overwhelming as a rookie investor as to I know I don't want to invest in where I live right now, but where do I even start to analyze the market? And I think right there, you just gave a great example. Start with places you've been that you've noticed things or that you've even just liked the city or you're going to end up going there occasionally. I think that's a great starting point as to where you can analyze a deal. And then after that, if you can't, if none of those markets work where places you've been or you've known or even like your hometown, like that's always a great starting point, too, because growing up somewhere, you know that that market and have a better idea than somebody who's never been there. And then just like looking where other people are investing too. So doesn't mean you should invest there because other people are investing there, but that's like a great starting point is looking on social media, the bigger pockets forums and where other people are investing, then going and verifying data and doing your own research. But that's like a huge struggle as a rookie as to like, how do I find a market? And I think you gave a great example as you just picked a market that you were familiar with and you noticed things. So what are, besides like that, you noticed that they were doing a lot of, you know, is, I don't know if gentrification would be the the right term there, bringing these old buildings back to life, things like that. Were there any other things that you look for in a market that may be important for a rookie to kind of keep an eye out? Yeah. I mean, um, I guess I, I would look for, like what you said, look for areas that you're, 
that you've been to, uh, any, anything that gives you maybe some sort of advantage, even if it's like somewhere where you grew up um, or if you've got friends that live there that you can have them kind of uh, help with boots on the ground, like checking out the properties or, or kind of driving for dollars, any of that kind of stuff. Um, but the other things that I would, that I, I mean, for me anyway, that I really just look for is kind of where is that price to rent ratio as well. Um, looking up like where has, um, where have prices kind of gone in the last couple of years? You can look back to, you know, the, the 2008 crash or whatever, see how they do through different like market cycles. Um, can you just explain real quick what the price to rent ratio is? Yeah. The, so the price to rent ratio is essentially, um, how much, you know, like, okay, a commonly used term would be like that, the 1% ratio or, or the, that, or the 1% rule or the 2% rule or something like that. But a, a 1% rule is that the monthly um, rent is 1% of what the purchase price is. And so that's kind of like that price to rent ratio right there where you want to figure out where does your monthly rent compare to your purchase price overall. Um, and, and they use the one, uh, the one percent rule as like a rule of thumb that, you know, if it, if the monthly rent is 1% versus the purchase price, that's a pretty good deal. Um, I think Brandon Turner even did like a while back on his social media saying something like the 2% rule is almost like a given that if it, if it falls in the 2% uh, rule, it's going to cash flow. Um, and more than anything, I just, I'd advise people to make sure that when you're starting to try to see if, I guess it depending on what kind of method that you're going with, um, whether it be cash flow or appreciation. But for anybody starting, I think if you go with the cash flow method, where as long as the property cash flows after all of your expenses, after after your taxes, after your mortgage, after everything, it's a pretty safe bet that you're not going to lose the property. You're not going to like even through mistakes, even if you do something wrong, whatever. If it still cash flows, or even if it cash flow is negative, you're at least like you're in you're in the black, or or you're not in the red anymore. Do you know what I mean? You're not going to have this kind of be like a money suck project. Um, and and more than anything, I, I really just encourage people to to just pick a market. It could be any market. We picked we picked Columbus, Georgia, kind of because I knew the market, kind of because I've been there but also kind of because it was just like the first really good deal that I found on the MLS. And I was like, oh, that looks pretty good. And I kind of know that market. I think I'm kind of just going to take a chance. And that's kind of how it works is that no matter what your first deal is, it's always going to feel a little bit risky. You're always going to feel like you don't quite know enough. And they call it like a leap of faith for a reason because eventually you just have to kind of jump and go for it. Um, and we could kind of get into like the whole like risk and reward and, and fear analogies and all that kind of stuff. And again, cause I, I deal with a lot of, a lot of fear from, from kayaking and, and from, you know, my, my history and, and background in whitewater. And I try to remind myself that fear is false evidence appearing real. Fear happens all the time. We all deal with fear. And, you know, I get regularly called crazy and, and that kind of thing. If I go over, you know, an 80 foot waterfall, people are like, you're crazy. But what they're not realizing is like the analysis between like fear and danger and, and scouting those rapids and scouting that waterfall and trying to analyze, okay, what is actually dangerous? Where are the actual dangers in this scenario? Can I avoid those dangers? And then if all that is left is the fear after I take away all the dangers and I remove all of those out of the equation, then I know the rest is just fear. And that's kind of like the the demons of the mind as I kind of deal with. Um, and it's the same with real estate. I was extremely afraid and fearful with real estate, but I knew that I just tried to analyze, okay, what are the actual dangers in this scenario? Okay. Can what if my house burns down? Oh, well, can I get insurance for that? Okay, well, maybe I'll remove that. Uh, how am I going to manage this property from the road? Well, can I hire a property manager to do that? Okay, well, I remove that fear or that uh, s scenario. Um, what if like, what if there's a break-in? Um, well, 
can insurance cover that? What if there, there, there's all these fears and you just try to like list them all out and then figure out like, okay, what are actual dangers? What are actual scenarios that could go wrong? How can I, you know, avoid those? How can I address those? How can I prepare for those? And if whatever's left after, after that, that's just the fear. That's just kind of like the demons of the mind. And you know that that's that false evidence appearing real after the dangers are gone, just go forward and, and uh, take action. Nick, that is that is a great analogy um, about fear. I've, I've I've actually never really heard it phrased that way about danger versus fear. And so many new real estate investors confuse those two things. And just because it's it's outside of their comfort zone, they think it's dangerous. But it's not it's not necessarily dangerous. They're, they're just afraid. So what a what a great breakdown. What a great analogy. I, I just want to make one comment on the on the market selection piece because I know so many investors they get stuck on that part alone where they'll spend months and months and months and months trying to find like the perfect, uh, you know, like Goldilocks market to start investing in. And the the approach that I've always taken is that just because you start investing in a certain market doesn't mean you have to be committed to that market forever, right? Like I, I started investing in Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, we no longer buy any properties there. Now we, we invest in multiple different markets a- across the country. But I learned so many good lessons by just getting started. And I think for most people that are listening, if you don't have that first deal yet, instead of overanalyzing and and wasting a bunch of time trying to find that perfect market, just pick a market and learn the basics of real estate investing. And then you can kind of feel out whether or not you want to continue to invest there or if you want to go somewhere else. So like Nick, you went from uh, Columbus, Georgia to, to Cookville, Tennessee. And I'm sure when you started investing in that second market, you had a lot more confidence going into that deal than you did on that first one. So uh, that's just the point, just get started, right? And if you choose the wrong market, sell the property, move on to the next one. Yeah, and that kind of, it goes back to that that win or learn mentality. Do you know what I mean? Like you, you have to take those, that, that first step. You have to take those baby steps to get uh, into the game in the first place. Um, and then you either win with that first property or you learn from that first property and continue moving forward. Uh, it, it's just like that, you know, the game of life or the game of finance or the game of whatever, you know, there, there's always a next step. So just keep moving forward. And eventually, you know, you'll get to whatever that end goal is. You'll, you'll, you'll reach that result. I have another phrase that I remind myself always too. Um, it's that uh, if you never give up, you, you cannot lose, uh, meaning that you will always win as long as you keep moving forward. You keep taking action. You keep, you know, learning from those mistakes. Um, and so, yeah, kind of going back to which market to pick, I was in that analysis paralysis. I was the one that was listening to all the different, you know, um, bigger pockets podcasts. I was the one asking those questions on the forums, like, where should I invest? Um, and eventually I just, I picked a market and I just went for it. And I just tried knowing that like, okay, well, you know, Maybe this first deal isn't going to be the right one. Maybe I'll have to learn from these mistakes. Maybe I'll have to sell it. Who knows? Um, but but by taking that first step, it enables me to take the second step and the third step and the fourth step. I think everybody just wants to maximize their return. So their first deal, they're thinking, I just have this amount of money or I have this skill set or I have this time or whatever it is. What is the best way for me to use it and take advantage of, you know, this opportunity? And you can get so caught up on that is the best way to maximize your return. But just getting started is going to be a way better return than you waiting five years for that home run deal to come about or wasting so much time trying to decide, um, do I use my cash to buy one property? Do I spread it out over five properties? Do I invest it in something else? Then go and buy a property is just pick one because a lot of the times they're all wins. You're all, you're making a return somehow. Maybe you're giving up more time or less time based on what the return is for that. But it's just that just getting started and it's going to propel you because that one deal could be one of thousands of deals that you'll do later on. And you, that deal won't even matter anymore because it propelled you to, to bring on all these other deals and just getting started. So 
But Nick, one thing you talked about was that people say you're crazy. And I'm assuming you're talking about like the risk of, you know, kayaking and white rabbits. But did anybody think that about you too, when you started to invest in real estate? And, you know, what about your spouse? How did you get your spouse on board? And what does kind of your support system look like as an investor? Uh, so you got a couple questions there, and, and I'll try to answer them in order there, Ashley. Um, first off, yeah, I definitely get called crazy sometimes, and, and that would be due to like the kayaking aspect and, and running waterfalls and whatever it might be. Nick, when you said 80-foot waterfalls, I thought you were a little crazy too, man. Like uh, 80 feet, I can't even like picture that in my mind. So there, there's a little bit of crazy in there for sure. It's like an eight-story building, Tony. Think of it like <laughs> yeah. that. You'll, you'll be fine. But um, yeah. but. Yeah. So, and it's the same in real estate. It's the same in so many things um, where if you go kind of against the grain or against maybe like what society might deem as normal, then people are going to probably start calling you crazy. And for the most people, you know, you buy a house and you live in it and, and you you have a nine to five job and, and that's just kind of what life work looks like. If you start doing things that are kind of outside that, people will start calling you a little bit crazy. And, and the more that you veer outside of that, uh, the more that you got called crazy. And so definitely, you know, I, I have been told throughout my entire life that, you know, people question regularly, like, what am I doing? What am I doing when I wanted to get into kayaking at, 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 when I was starting? What am I doing, you know, when I, I, after high school, left to go continue kayaking, travel the world, um, and not go to university? People started questioning and, and thinking I'm crazy if like I'm having a family without having like, you know, this uh, this university or college degree. How am I going to support my my kids and my family moving forward? People think I'm going to that I'm crazy if I'm you know going to start a podcast or start real estate or, or doing anything. People that isn't like deemed normal, they're going to start questioning you and being like, I don't I don't think you should do that. You know, my. My uncle bought real estate one day and he didn't do so well. So I don't think it's a good idea. And it's like, well, either instead of just kind of like following, you know, the narrative of, of what maybe society might deem as normal or um, or OK, something that I, I guess what I learned through a lot of my travels and, and what I'm super fortunate uh, to have been able to travel the world, but that that we grow up with this narrative of kind of like being taught what is right, what is wrong, what is normal, right? Here in America, it's super normal for us to eat cows. It seems normal. We have we have burgers all the time. It's in like American dish. You go to India and it's like, you know, not forbidden, but you, you would never eat a cow because it's a religious animal. You go to um, here in America, we would never eat horses. That's, it's like a pet animal. It's just like deemed like you would just never do that. You go to Iceland, that's just normal. So you just have to start realizing that whatever kind of is deemed normal might just be the environment that you grew up in. And the more that you kind of look outside that box, the more that you realize like, oh, for us three right now for this conversation, investing in real estate is totally normal but maybe not for everybody. So it might be like opening and widening that horizon um, and that idea of what normal might be and trying to kind of realize like, oh, there might be other ways to do this. And so, um, yeah, that, that kind of answers your question a little bit of, of people calling me crazy. Back to like, is my wife supportive? Luckily for me, um, in this whole like journey of trying to figure out the the game of money and the game of finance, I have uh, I tried some like some stock uh, stock trading and some options trading and and definitely lost money in some of that. And so my wife was way more on board with real estate. We've been on, kind of talking about real estate since we were since we got married. And so I'm I'm super fortunate that she's uh, on board with that as well. And she really likes the idea of investing in real estate. That's a great strategy, Nick. It's like if you if you try something and you fail miserably, then when you try and, and do something like real estate where the odds of success are a little bit higher, now the spouse is like, okay, cool, you failed before, but I think this one has a better shot. So it's like a almost like a reverse psychology type <laughs> trick, you know? So I like that. Tony, yeah. are you telling uh, everyone yeah. to go gamble on the stock market and do day trading for a couple of weeks, yeah. lose a ton of yeah. money, then invest in real estate to get their spouse on board? Is that your recommendation now? <laughs> I, I think that might be the new best plan to get spouses on board. 
Um, no, no, please don't do that. Please, please, please don't do that. And if you guys get messages from me and Ashley after this episode asking you guys to invest in crypto, just know it is not me. It is not Ashley. There's a bunch of bunch of scammers out there that are pushing people to do that. So anyway, um, I want to go back to to your other point, Nick, about being being normal and 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 why you're you're okay with not being normal. And I was like, as you were talking, I was just like looking up some stats. The the median household income in the United States is just over thirty one thousand dollars, and the median net worth is just over one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and the average person in America is actually considered obese. Um, so it's like if you want to be, and and not even to think about like the average person gets up, goes to the same job nine to five, they probably hate it, do that for 30, 40 years, then they retire with very little money left over. And I, I have this conversation with my son all the time about not caring about being normal because normal means that you're you're underpaid, you're 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 close to being broke, you're unhappy with the job that you have, maybe you're unhappy in your relationships. It's like I don't want to be normal by any sense of the definition. Yeah, I want I want to do things that make people think that I am weird because if I'm doing that, it probably means I'm on a path towards success. So like the the, the whole idea of being normal. I think we, we need to push that aside as real estate investors. And honestly, I think that's why this podcast, this this rookie community is so important because now you can interact with people who are just as weird as you are and, and are willing to do a lot of the crazy things that you are as well. So I, I appreciate you kind of sharing that insight with us. And it's also a lot more fun to not be normal because um, that's that's where like the adventure is. That's where the excitement is in life. Um, and And I don't know. I think everybody, each one of us is, is unique, right? So each, each, every person has their own things that their own passions, the, the things that they love, the things that they enjoy doing, figure out what that is and, uh, and just go chase that. And, and yeah, I don't know. I, I encourage people to, uh, to, ch- to chase their dreams, no matter, uh, how weird society might deem them. I feel like almost once you get into like the real estate investing community, It's almost like this secret society that's not a secret, but it's like all these aha moments or like epiphanies of like the American dream. You work a W-2 job, nine to five, you retire on your pension, you have a house that's on a mortgage for your whole life with that white picket fence. And it's just like, that's really not the American dream. Like Nick, you talking about like traveling around the country for your job. A lot of people are like, wow, I wish I could leave and just like go all over all the time. Or maybe it's somebody that, you know, wants to move, have short-term rentals and different properties. And for three months, live in Florida, three months, live in Colorado and all these things. And I think you really, even in the beginning, you kind of touched on schools and how schools are built to have you memorize data and they're built to make you an employee, basically, not an entrepreneur, not to run anything. They're built to make you an employee. And I just like think all of these things as you get involved with these like minded individuals who realize that real wealth is out there and you don't have to climb the corporate rat ladder to be a CEO, to have this high net worth, that there's way easier ways to do it. And real estate investing is definitely one of those and just opens up so many possibilities and opportunities that a lot of us couldn't even fathom, you know, maybe even growing up thinking that this is what our life would be now. And it's just because we actually did something normal. We bought a couple houses. Buying houses is normal. It's not like we went and invented some kind of app or piece of technology that created wealth for us. We did something that's actually quite easy. It's just like you talked about, Nick, overcoming that fear and understanding what the risk actually is and getting into it. So, oh, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to add to add to that that um, that that success and and maybe um, wealth or or anything like that is going to be deemed a little bit different for each one of us. Do you know what I mean? Everybody kind of has their own idea of what that dream life might be, what that success looks like. And it could be it could be one rental, it could be financial freedom, it could be the ability to travel, the the time freedom uh, to spend with family. So realize that don't get caught up on what society might deem success looks like, um, and don't get too caught up on just like what society deems as normal because we 
we um, make heroes out of so many people that went against the grain and kind of chase their own passions, um, like Walt Disney or or Elon Musk or like just so many people that that I'm sure during their time um, were deemed a little bit crazy and and a little bit against the norm. And then later on in life, we're like, oh, look at those guys that just kind of chased their dreams and and you know, went for it. So for, for all the rookies out there, I highly encourage you guys to figure out what your why is and, and just go for it. No matter what it might be, just take some action, take baby steps. Cause that helps like minimize that fear. Um, but take action either way. That's great, Nick. Thank you. Okay. So let's talk about one of your deals. Let's get into the numbers of it. Do you have a property in mind that you want to go over? I do have a property in mind. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, um, it's gonna be kind of rapid fire. I'm just gonna ask you some quick questions and then you can kind of go into the, the story of it. So uh, where is this property located? Uh, this was our first ever property and it is located in Columbus, Georgia. And what is the strategy? The strategy was uh, the Burr method and I was literally taking it straight out of the pages of long distance real estate investing by David Green. And how many units is it? It is four units, and it's actually two side-by-side duplexes. Um, and ironically, it was listed on the MLS. I think it had it was written up as a duplex, but the square footage and the the bedroom count and everything it had per unit. So it literally it was listed as I think two bedroom, one bath. And then I'm looking, and I was like, that doesn't make any sense. And the photo had this like this kind of odd photo from the street looking at it. And it looked like it's two, you know, parallel side by side duplexes. And I was like, I think this might be like, you know, either they didn't write it up right in the listing or, or this just might be one of those opportunities that's uh, too good to be true. So I gave him a call and uh, got some information on it. And I think we put it in an offer that day. That's a good tip is that MLS listings are not always accurate. Uh, Sometimes you can go through a property too and like, look at the pictures and be like, wait, those two kitchens are different. Are there two kitchens in this property? And they have it listed as a single family instead of a two unit. What was the purchase price that you ended up um, getting this property for? So the purchase price, this is going to be more normal for you, Ashley, probably a little crazy for Tony. Uh, the, The purchase price, it was listed, actually, I guess it was listed for 45,000, um, for, for four units. And this was in the peak of fear, like, uh, May, June of 2020. So the peak of COVID fear, um, and it was our first deal and, and I was pretty intimidated, but I was running the numbers and they had the, the agent, it was actually a wholesaler, but the agent said that they were renting at 500 a unit and I'm running the numbers in my head. I'm like, this seems way too good to be true. So we just kind of kept going one step forward, making an offer, one step forward, you know, doing our um, our inspection, one step forward, uh, kind of continue that way. And then uh, we eventually closed on the property um, for 42000 Awesome. And then how much rehab did you have to put into the property? So this is where it gets interesting. Um, technically, we put in, uh, we probably put in about 12,000 or so into it now, give or take. Um, but when we first did the burr strategy, we were able to burr it without putting any rehab into it. Um, and the wild part was just the way that, uh, the banks work that you guys know, you have to have owned the property for six months before you can, uh, refinance the property. And I don't know if it was just within those six months or if that it was kind of right from the peak fear of COVID into the crazy boom that went right after it. Um, but we purchased it for 42 and six months later it appraised for 126. And so those we are the able best to deals. All of our money. Yeah, it was it was literally I left the closing office laughing and almost feeling like I had done something illegal because I was just like wait a second, I can close on this property. I I now have no money into the property. My tenants are paying my mortgage and still a little bit of cash flow. And now I've got 30,000 in my pocket to go buy another deal. Like I was just mind blown. I literally was like why does everybody not do this? And so since then, 
I've I've been trying to tell, you know, speak from the balcony to everybody that'll that's open to listen. Like, you should probably look at this whole real estate thing. There's money to be made here. That is awesome, Nick. Um, what a great first property to get to. I'm sure that even just made you more motivated to go out and uh, get your next deal. Um, so with the taking out the, did you take out 80% then of the appraised value for the mortgage? Uh, I think we took out, I'd have to go back and look. It was either, I think it was 75 uh, loan to value. So I think we took, we took out of, uh, out of the refinance, I think we took 72 back out. Um, so we paid off what our down payment was, or we paid, yeah, we paid off our, our purchase price cause we paid in cash. And then, um, and then we still had 30,000 left. Now 12 of that went into rehabbing cause one of those units ended up being a hoarder unit afterwards. Um, which I wasn't fully aware of because I had never seen the property in person. Um, but either way, I mean, it was just, again, like one of those things that it was, uh, it was, a just another learning step along the way. And, and I feel like life is filled with all these, uh, these steps that, that were to learn from and, and keep moving forward. But it was that first baby step that got my foot in the door in real estate. And it is definitely the one that, you know, uh, keeps me moving forward because I can just see the power of what real estate has to offer. Yeah, well, I love hearing stories about successful first deals, Nick, and it's like that that gateway drug into doing more and more and more of that same thing. So we appreciate you sharing that story with us, Nick. Uh, I want to take us next to our rookie request line. And for those of you that are listening, uh, if you would like your question featured on the show, just give us a call at 8885-ROOKIE, uh, leave a voicemail, and we might just use it on the next show. So Nick, are you ready for today's uh, rookie request line question? I think I'm as ready as I'll ever be, Tony. All right. So here's today's question. It comes from Trudy in Sacramento. Trudy says, my husband and I have just started our, our real estate investing journey. We're researching right now. We're both W-2 workers. I'm a part-time worker, which would give me more time to be able to do the researching and eventually like manage the properties. We have money, about $180,000 set aside for an investment, but we're kind of looking around realizing that California is a really expensive market. And we're wondering what area, uh, if any, that we should venture to outside of California and if it would be a good start start to do that. And they're also trying to determine whether or not they should buy a single family property versus a multifamily property. Any ideas would be greatly appreciated. So Nick, as someone who's kind of struggled with that same, some of those same questions, uh, what advice would you have for Trudy? Trudy, um, those are some great questions right there. I would encourage you to take that money and probably uh, look outside of California. Um, and I would first maybe pick up David Green's book on uh, uh, long distance real estate investing, because you're going to learn all of, you know, the ways to do it outside of your state and, and not being there and not being present, uh, and, and being able to build that team up out of state, but that money is probably going to be able to go a lot further outside of California. Honestly, I would probably look at the Southeast. I think there's a lot of opportunity in the Southeast, uh, which is, you know, a lot of different States that could be Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, um, could be the Carolinas. Um, Ashley might tell you to go up to New York and that there's a lot of opportunity up there, but maybe she won't because she wants to keep them all for herself. I'm not sure. The the tenant landlord laws are awful here. <laughs> and it takes like years to close. <laughs> the, the Southeast is definitely pretty, uh, landlord friendly in, in that regard as well. So I would maybe look in the Southeast. Uh, I would definitely look out of state and start uh, trying to build that core four, uh, and as far as whether to build or to buy a uh, single family versus multifamily, you know, uh, I would encourage if possible to, to kind of start in that small multifamily, whether it be a duplex, triplex, quadplex, because for the most part, the lending is going to be just as favorable, uh, with the 30 year loans, um, as a single family might be, but you get the, the bonuses of getting, you know, two rents, three rents or four rents, depending on kind of what kind of small multifamily it is. And it just, uh, it helps kind of recognize that power of real estate when you start getting, you know, multiple rents coming in a month. So, uh, Trudy, I, I wish you the absolute best with your journey and, uh, very excited for you guys. And yeah, definitely maybe pick up a book, go listen to some old podcasts and, um, and look out of state. Yeah, that's wonderful advice, Nick. So I just want to take us to our, our next segment here, which is our, uh, rookie exam. 
Uh, so these are three questions that we want to ask every single guest when they come on. And Nick, these are the three most important questions that anyone will ever ask you in your life. Um, so Nick, are you ready for the exam today? Man, three most important questions ever. I'm ready. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> All right. First question. What is one actionable thing Ricky should do after listening to your episode? One most actionable thing that they should do is, um, is figure out where you're at in the whole process. If you're stuck in that analysis paralysis, figure out how to overcome that fear by looking at the dangers, listing them out and realizing, okay, what are actual dangers? How could I avoid these? And how could we move forward? And, and essentially just taking action with those baby steps. So if you've never done a deal before, uh, maybe go on to the bigger pockets uh, uh, calculators and start analyzing a deal for your first ever deal. If uh, if you've already done that, maybe call up your lender and see if you can get pre-approved. If you've already done that, maybe maybe write an offer. Maybe if you're too afraid, just write such a low ball offer that you know that you're not going to get the property, but at least then you've written your first offer and you know the process of writing an offer. And, and all of these are just little baby steps, baby steps, baby steps, and eventually it'll get you uh, to your first ever rental property or your first ever home or, or whatever it is that that goal might be. But recognize that you can um, overcome the fear by realizing the difference between fear and danger, and then just take those baby steps to take action and continue moving forward. Nick, what is one tool, software, app, or system in your business that you use? Um, one tool, app, or system. Honestly, um, this is going to sound pretty funny, um, but I would say as far as apps go, you know, I've kind of, I've set up our whole system with you know, out of state in mind, being that I want to be able to travel, I want to be able to be on the road, I want to be away from these properties. So we've got managers that are set in place to do it all. Uh, the two apps that I use the most would be one, the podcast app on my phone, because I, I just constantly listen to Bigger Pockets uh, podcast to your podcast, uh, and I'm constantly just trying to learn new creative strategies, learn uh, new ways that I could be, you know, writing offers, new ways that I could be uh, taking action and and moving forward with my goals. And then the other one would be like the Zillow app. Uh, all of our deals that I found are all off of the MLS. It's going to sound super cliche or weird, but it's worked. Um, and I've, if I've got free time, I try to make at least every day I look at the different markets that we're interested in and I'll just do a quick five minute search to see if there's new properties. Um, or even if, if there's a new market that I want to look at, but, uh, yeah, probably those would be the two apps that I use the most would be maybe, uh, the Zillow app and, and the podcast app on my phone. All right. And obviously Nick's favorite podcast is the Real Estate Ricky Show. I know he didn't mention that part, but I just wanted to plug that in for him anyway. So we'll, we'll move on to the to the last question there. So Nick, where do you plan on being in five years? This is probably going to be, again, um, you know, against the grain of what most of your guests might say, but I kind of want to be right where I'm at. I wake up again every day feeling like I live this dream life. So I want to continue living this dream life. I want to continue traveling the world, uh, continue doing this, you know, family adventure TV show that we've got, continue spending time with my kids, getting outdoors. Um, so for a lot of it, I just kind of want to keep doing what I'm doing. As far as finances go, uh, I definitely want to get uh, or want to be financially free. And, and within five years, that's definitely a goal of mine is to be financially free to essentially substitute all of our current finances through our real estate to have that backup if something were to ever occur. Um, but yeah, keep on living life and uh, living it to the fullest, Tony. Awesome, Nick. I, I love that, brother. And, you know, sometimes it's not about necessarily changing your life, but just kind of fortifying the life that you already live. And it sounds like that's the path that you're on. So we, we appreciate you answering those questions for you or for us, Nick. And, and just a heads up, you passed the exam. Uh, so you, you, you passed with flying colors. So we appreciate that. Um, so before we wrap up, I just want to highlight this week's Ricky Rockstar. And this week's Ricky Rockstar is Andres Uribe. And Andres says, uh, this is my second long distance purchase. 
closed two months after my first purchase. And the second one is a six unit multifamily property in Pennsylvania. Bought it for 330 grand using hard money. Uh, rehab was supposed to be 90K, uh, but had to fire a contractor and then took a while for him to evict the tenants. Uh, had to catch up and had to hire four different construction crews and went over $67,000 on, uh, on the budget. Uh, but either way, uh, he has an opportunity to increase the rents, get a pretty high NOI. Um, and he's hoping that it'll appraise for about $700,000 once it's all said and done. Um, actually, he, he added one little note at the bottom. He, and I guess it's a, a 12 month update. Andre said, uh, 12 months later, nowhere near the profit I was expecting, but man, have I learned a ton. Growth has been the key here. It has been scary, but an amazing learning experience. Every time I get a curveball that could have ruined the deal and me, I smile and I find it exciting. I don't freak out. There is no choice but to keep moving. I bought this quote unquote stressful situation on myself. No one else did. Uh, I tried to create wealth and eventually I will. So uh, this what a what a great uh, Ricky Rockstar to kind of tie into everything you talked about today, Nick, of rolling with the punches taking these quote unquote failures and turning them into lessons and realizing that failure doesn't happen until you give up. So Andres, we can't wait to, to hear what that ne next successful deal looks like. And when it does happen, Andres, be sure to, to put in your app for the show so we can get you on here and, and share the story with everybody. It's like a college tuition. <laughs> yeah. So many people go to college and they are afraid of you know, like, oh my gosh, but I went to school for this degree. Like if I don't work in this, it's like a waste that I, you know, wasted the degree. But look at how many real estate investors have quit their jobs. They went to school for, you know, four to seven years or whatever that may have been. And then they find real estate and then they end up quitting and leaving. If you do lose money on the first deal, um, that could be your college tuition and you could be making money on the next one. So yeah, I, I really like this rookie rock star story today. Congrats to Andreas. And uh, it sounds like an amazing deal. And, and like everything that we've been talking about, uh, it's the, the win or learn mentality. And I think, uh, I think he's winning in the long run. So uh, super excited uh, where he goes with it for sure. Well, Nick, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, could you let everyone know where they could reach out to you and find out some more information about you? Um, yeah, where can people reach out to me? Um, probably most active on Instagram. So you can check me out at Nick Troutman Kayak. Troutman is like the fish and then man. Uh, so Nick Troutman Kayak is my Instagram handle. Um, if you're interested in more of the kind of like family adventure content, uh, check out Great Family Adventure, which is separated by a period of each word. So great.family.adventure is another one. And that's kind of our, our family adventure TV show. But feel free to reach out. I'm pretty active and I try to answer every single comment and every um, um, message that gets sent to me. So would love to connect with you guys. And really, I guess the other thing I didn't even mention that, uh, yeah, I've got a podcast called the, um, the art of awesome. And it's a lot about what we've been talking about today, which is just encouraging people, um, to, you know, reach their goals to be as awesome as they can be. So, uh, feel free to check that out too, if you guys are interested in uh, a little bit more motivation, but stoked to talk with any of you guys. So feel free to reach out. That's awesome. I, I can't wait to check out your podcast and um, maybe one day Tony and I can be guests on it and we could, you know, go out kayaking together and podcast live from the <laughs> river or something. <laughs> let's, let's make it happen for sure. Yeah, definitely. That'd be so fun. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really uh, appreciated all the advice uh, that you gave and for sharing your story with us. I'm Ashley at Wealth From Rentals, and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson on Instagram. And we will be back on Saturday with a rookie reply. Still, yeah.